It's fair to say Prime Minister Paul Keating didn't think too highly of the Senate. Unrepresentative swell over there. The Senate has been described as a mishmash, oddballs, a motley crew, and even been compared to the aliens in the bar scene of Star Wars. Hey, we don't serve their kind here. So why all the hate? It boils down to Australia's bicameral system. A bicameral system is one that has two houses or chambers. Having two houses of parliament means that one chamber doesn't get too big for its boots. In Australia, we have the Senate and the House of Representatives, named after our mates over there in the USA. The House of Representatives, or lower house, is the House of Government. That means that the party or formal coalition with the most seats there becomes the ruling party. If a party or coalition gets 76 or more seats out of that 150 after an election, they get to form government. If they've got the numbers, they can call the shots. The House is where most legislation, called bills, originates before becoming law. Bills have to go through both Houses of Parliament before they become law. The Senate was intended to be a House of Review, that is, to keep a government that usually has power in the House of Reps in check. Members of the House of Reps represent a geographic area, known as electorates or seats, made up of roughly 100,000 voters each. The electorates match up with our population spread, so New South Wales has 47 seats, while the Northern Territory has just two. At the moment, there are 150 members of the House of Reps, but that's going to increase by one seat in the 2019 federal election. That's to reflect an increase in Australia's population overall. South Australia will lose a seat due to its shrinking population, while both Victoria and the ACT will each gain a seat. So what about the Senate? The Senate, or Upper House, represents the states. So if you're a New South Wales voter, you're voting for the same candidates whether you live in Byron or Batemans Bay. Unlike the House, the number of senators are spread equally across the states, regardless of their populations. 12 each in the states and two each in the territories, taking us up to 76 in total, which gives the less populated states an edge. Because to be elected a senator, you need roughly 14% of the vote. 14% of Tassie voters is a damn sight smaller than 14% of Victoria's. So that brings us back to this. Unrepresentative swell. You've probably noticed that there are a lot of independents and minor parties, that is, not the big two, in the Senate. They're called the crossbench because they physically sit between the government and the opposition in the chamber and they have a tendency to really annoy the government. The system has been gamed, and it is simply not transparent. I mean, we believe fervently, passionately, in a transparent democracy, so that you should know who you vote for. The ruling party does not need a majority in the Senate. In fact, that's only happened twice in the last 40 years. The last time a ruling party also had a majority in the Senate was way back in 2004. Having a majority in the Senate means the ruling party can get through controversial legislation without amendment and often with very little debate, which would explain some of Paul Keating's vitriol. You're probably wondering why there are so many independents and smaller parties elected to the Senate. It's got to do with how we vote in the Senate, a system called proportional representation. We'll delve into the murky world of preferences at a later date, but let's just say for now that they're super important in determining the makeup of the Senate. Under proportional representation, when a candidate hits the required quota to get them elected, all subsequent votes go to either whoever the candidate has preferenced or who you as a voter has marked as your second in line. That redistribution keeps on going until other candidates hit their limit for the quota. Independents and smaller parties, who may not have the star power to hit a quota on their own, are usually elected on preferences of voters who gave their first vote to another candidate. Which is why people who only get a handful of primary votes can end up as elected senators. Voters can vote above the line, which means they pick their favourite party and let the party order the candidates how they please. Or they can vote below the line, where they can choose whatever candidates in whatever order they like. Just before the 2016 federal election, then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull changed the rules for how we vote in the Senate. 
Before then, you either had to vote for one above the line or number each and every single box below the line. In a state like New South Wales, there were literally dozens of candidates. So it's no surprise that only 4% of voters chose that option. From 2016 onwards, voters will have to number at least six boxes above the line or 12 below. The idea was that it would give voters more control over where their votes go. But in practice, it also reduced the ironclad grip that major parties had on candidates. Both Labor's Lisa Singh and Liberal candidate Richard Colbeck won spots in the Senate from seemingly unwinnable positions on the ballot by mounting a grassroots campaign to get their supporters to vote below the line. That's how you vote for the Senate. So what about the House? The number of candidates per seat is substantially less than the number of candidates on the Senate ballot. Voters have to rank every candidate in order of preference. So that cuts out those opaque backroom deals made between parties that can sometimes happen in the Senate. Political parties will try to influence your preferences with how to vote cards. But really, the ultimate power when it comes to voting for a House of Reps candidate lies with you, the voter.